listening to The History of the Modern Middle East, Episode 10, The Balkan Wars. Okay, so in the previous two episodes, we covered the history of the Balkans from the 18th century up to 1912 and the eve of the war. Well, today we are finally going to get into the Balkan Wars themselves and see the final removal of Ottoman control over European territory. Starting in the 1880s, Bulgaria began building up its military through increasingly large purchases from the French firm schneider Creusot and the Krupps of Germany, and these purchases were financed by loans from the Great Powers. This spending eventually led to Bulgaria declaring bankruptcy in 1902, which led to a debt commission being placed on them, similar to what the Great Powers had placed on the Ottomans. Despite the restrictions usually made on countries with foreign debt commissions, the Great Powers didn't put any significant restrictions on Bulgaria's purchase of war materials. By the end of the 1900s, nearly a third of the Bulgarian national budget was spent on the military, and the imposed universal conscription on all able-bodied men up to 46 years old, which boosted the size of the army so much that the military schools weren't able to keep up with the demand for officers. By the fall of 1912, Bulgaria had the largest army of any of the Balkan states. Serbia followed a similar path as Bulgaria, with government spending being bloated by military expenditures. The army became more and more influential within the Serbian government, especially after the assassination of Alexander I, who had tried to limit the power of the officer corps. Under his successor Peter I, who came from the rival Kara Georgievich dynasty, the officers continued to grow in power and resources, and the great powers, especially France, continued to finance these purchases. The primary exception to this growing preparedness for war was Greece. This was partly due to their defeat against the Ottomans in 1897 over the island of Crete which left the Greek army demoralized. Crete was eventually made part of Greece, but only because of the chaos of 1908 after the Young Turks took power. With the military having so little confidence from the public, they were not able to sway public policy in the same way their Bulgarian and Serbian counterparts were. On top of that, Greece has had far more international meddling in its internal affairs since its formation earlier in the 19th century. Monarchs have been approved of by the great powers for the sole purpose of keeping Greece neutral in international affairs. The political parties of Greece were vehicles for individuals or their families to gain control of the government rather than ideology or policy. Essentially, the politics and military of Greece were too corrupt to have any kind of functional militarism. But in 1909, the Greek officer corps did pull off a coup, but instead of taking power directly for themselves, they handed it over to a politician from Crete, Eleptherios Venezuelos. What little preparedness Greece had prior to the Balkan Wars can be credited to him. In September 1911, war broke out between the Ottoman Empire and Italy, in which Italy invaded Ottoman-controlled Libya. Due to a weaker navy and Libya not being contiguous with the rest of the Ottoman Empire, the Turks were never able to directly reinforce their weaker forces in North Africa. The Ottomans, not wanting to appear weak, decided to defy international calls for them to surrender, which resulted in numerous massacres occurring in Libya. The Italians were able to take control of the coastal port cities, but not much beyond that which allowed the few Ottoman soldiers there to ally with the local tribes to keep the Italians hemmed in. As the Ottomans continued to lose ground to the Italians, the Balkan states saw an opportunity for personal gain. However, they were highly distrusting of each other. Bulgaria and Serbia had fought a war in the 1880s, both attempting to secure the position of Balkan's hegemon for themselves. The two of them, along with the Greece, all eyed up Ottoman Macedonia. The Montenegrins also eyed up northern Albania, which was also desired by the Serbs. Despite all of these disputes, they were able to come to one common goal, prevent the Turks from regaining control of the Balkans, and then drive them out of Europe. But the great powers never suspected that they would put aside these differences. The Ottomans looked particularly weak in the Balkans in the summer of 1912, when rebellions in Albania broke out in August. The Young Turks had prevented any Albanian deputies from being elected to parliament in the April election, which meant that they had no voice in the government to advocate for their interests. The rebels stole arms from Ottoman weapons depots, which was followed by Albanian regiments and the army joining their side and marching into Macedonia, occupying Scope. They had planned to occupy Salonika, the headquarters of the CUP, but the government in Istanbul agreed to grant them autonomy. In March of 1912, the Bulgarians and Serbians signed a secret treaty, and in the following months, additional treaties were made between Greece and Montenegro, bringing them into what historians know as the Balkan League. They knew their common goal, but the spoils of war had not yet been decided upon. 
They all had overlapping claims, and in their treaties they made only the barest mention of loose border proposals, and some didn't have any mention of it at all. It's most likely that all the Balkan states knew that trying to agree to borders beforehand would a. prevent the alliance from happening in the first place, and b. would not be approved by either Russia or the great powers. So they probably assumed that either another war would break out right after the first one, or the great powers would intervene and make the decision for them. The final treaty tying the Balkan League together would only be signed two days before their declaration of war in October of 1912. On September 30th, the Balkan states began mobilizing their forces, which was followed by a decree to mobilize what forces were left in the region by the Ottomans the next day. In response to the Ottoman mobilization, the Balkan League sent their demands on October 2nd, which included the appointment of a Christian governor general approved by the great powers for the province of Macedonia, along with legislative assemblies and foreign supervised reforms. The Ottoman government agreed to carry out the reforms that were in accordance with the International Commission of 1880, but they had to wait for the parliament to give it official sanction. The Balkan states were not willing to wait for the Turkish legislative process, and in fact had never intended to. The great powers had incentives to either prevent the war or to end it quickly. The balance of power in the eastern Mediterranean had been upset by the Italians going to war with the Ottomans. The need for greater naval power pushed the Ottomans into commissioning building of warships, and although they would be built in foreign harbors, they were destined for the eastern Mediterranean. On top of this, the Russians were also concerned about upsetting the balance of power in the Balkans. They preferred dealing with a weak Ottoman Empire rather than a strong Bulgaria or Serbia. Despite these concerns, most of the great powers believed the Balkan states were too divided to work together for long, and if that wasn't enough, they also believed that the Ottomans had the upper hand, given their victory against the Greeks back in the 1890s. In their own attempts to resolve the conflict diplomatically, the Ottoman government recalled former Grand Vizier Kamil Pasha back into office, hoping to use his personal ties to the British government to their advantage. He wrote letters to his contacts in London, imploring them to get the Russians to stop the Balkan League. Unfortunately, Kamil's appointment didn't have the desired effects on the great powers, and even worse, it created a rift between the liberal unionists and the CUP. The war would finally begin on October 8th, when Montenegro declared war on the Ottoman Empire by invading northern Albania. On top of their own territorial ambitions, the King of Montenegro had been receiving encouragement from his son-in-law, the King of Italy, to attack the Ottomans. The Ottomans had been stubbornly refusing to surrender Libya, and the Italians attacking Ottoman ports across the Mediterranean wasn't working. So if Italy could get Montenegro and the other Balkan states to open up another front for the Ottomans to fight on, they would be that much closer to victory. The Montenegrin armies headed for Scutari, which was the biggest anticipated spoil for King Nicholas. The Montenegrins were initially supported by the Malasori tribe, who were Albanian Catholics. King Nicholas had argued that their religious rights and traditions would be better protected under a Greek Orthodox Christian than under Muslim Turks. However, it didn't take too long for the Malasori to realize that Montenegro had no intention of looking out for their interests. The Ottomans couldn't fight a war on two fronts, and they knew the territory being threatened in the Balkans was more valuable than Libya. So on October 17th, the Ottoman and Italian government signed the Treaty of Lausanne, which gave political control of Libya to Italy, but allowed the Ottoman Sultan to appoint the Islamic judge, or Qadi, of Tripoli. A large number of Ottoman officers, including Mustafa Kemal, had been trapped in Libya, first by the Italian blockade and now by a Greek one. In order to get back to the Balkans so they could lead and fight, they had to sneak aboard foreign ships headed from Alexandria and British-controlled Egypt to Marseille, then by train to Bucharest and by river steamer to Constanta, and finally by ship along the Black Sea coast to Constantinople. This trip took the officers a month to make, only arriving in late November, all the while the Balkan states were making moves on the ground. Serbia had four armies, the first attacking Ottoman territories in northern Macedonia, the second crossing into Bulgaria and joining with them to invade eastern Macedonia, the third targeting Kosovo, and the fourth linking up with Montenegro and Novi Pazar in Albania. The leaders of the Albanian tribes met at Valona, and declared their own independence from the Ottoman Empire in hopes that this would convince the great powers to intervene on their behalf against the Serbs and Montenegrins. The Serbs had set their sights on Kosovo, which had been part of medieval Serbia, despite the population by this point being majority Albanian. Both Montenegro and Serbia wanted Albanian territory in order to gain access to the Adriatic Sea. Austria-Hungary and Italy both had interests in the region and demanded that Serbia and Montenegro withdraw, 
claiming that neither had legitimate reasons to be there because of the ethnic makeup of the region. However, the Balkan states retorted that Austria, Hungary, and Italy had no ethnic interests in Bosnia and Tripolitania, which the two had annexed respectively. So why shouldn't Serbia and Montenegro have Albania? Ultimately, they decided to play the Russia card against Italy and Austria-Hungary, threatening to drag the rest of the continent into the war if they weren't allowed to go as planned. The Bulgarians, who had the largest military, were tasked with attacking Thrace and marching towards Constantinople, the grand prize of all the Orthodox Christians, including Russia. Their two armies slammed into the Ottoman fortresses of, of Kirklareli and Erdirna, which were the gateway to the Ottoman capital. The Serbs were able to make quick ground against the Turks in Macedonia, routing their main forces at Kumanovo, which opened the route to scope. One of the reasons for this was the tendency of non-Muslim soldiers in the Ottoman army, especially Christians, to abandon their posts at the site of oncoming Balkan forces. In response to these desertions, the Ottoman soldiers began punishing the local inhabitants of Macedonia during their retreat. An official at the railway station in Scope described the situation like this. The Turks began beating Christians and Christian Turks. Most of the Christians hid at home. As the Serb bombardment approached, the earth began to shake and the windows started to shatter. The first Turk divisions ran amuck through the town in the retreat. They had no guns, open wounds without tourniquet, maimed, blood-soaked, and barefoot. The trains, roads, and battlefields were soaked with rain, snow, and mud. And all were littered with the bodies of horses, soldiers, and civilians. The Serbs enacted their own atrocities against the Albanians in retaliation for the rumored treatment of Christians during their uprising earlier that year. They burned Albanian villages and decapitated Albanian soldiers and civilians. The Turkish army had been woefully unprepared to deal with all the attacks. On top of their forces having recently been sent to fight the Italians, within the government itself there seemed to be a lack of planning for potential future conflicts. By November, Ottoman armies were in full retreat on every front falling back to Katalka, a city about 40 miles north of Constantinople. On November 6th, Kamil Pasha called a meeting of his ministers in which they began giving in to more of the demands of the great powers, such as allowing them to send ships to the Bosphorus in order to protect their assets in the capital. This revealed a lack of confidence for the Ottoman government, believing they wouldn't be able to hold the line or even to maintain law and order in their own city. The great powers had changed their initial positions on the status of the Balkans. The Austrian government, originally wanting no alteration to the regional balance of power, was now fine with an enlarged Serbia so long as it didn't include Albanian territory or any ports along the Adriatic. The great powers had rejected the Grand Vizier's request for mediation and was now seeking peace with individual members of the Balkan League in secret, especially with Bulgaria, who was the biggest threat to Constantinople. Meanwhile, the Greeks had been facing the weakest opposition from the Turks, but did deal with fierce resistance at Ionia, and were the only Balkan army to face a reversal at the hands of the Ottomans. This resulted in Serbian forces needing to bail the Greeks out at Batola. The battle there was the single largest battle in the Balkan Wars, despite the town being so small. Over 100,000 Serbian soldiers faced off against 80,000 or so Ottomans. Three days of fighting left 12,000 Serbians and 17,000 Turkish soldiers dead. The Ottoman forces in Macedonia surrendered on November 18th, with 45,000 being taken prisoner, but another 30,000 escaped to the mountains along the border between Macedonia and Albania, many continuing to fight as guerrillas. The Greeks had a much better time at sea. Their navy was stronger than that of the Ottomans, but not strong enough to break through the Dardanelles. This allowed the Greeks to occupy most of the Ottoman-owned islands in the Aegean, excluding the Dodecanese, which were still occupied by Italy despite the treaty ending the Tripolitanian War, and Cyprus, which had been occupied by the British since 1878. Although the Greeks didn't make it to the Battle of Batola, they much preferred their other prize, capturing Salonika, the headquarters of the CUP. Prior to the city's capture, the telegraph lines had ceased working, and thus the residents didn't realize how badly the war was going for the Turks until thousands of refugees and retreating soldiers arrived in the city. 20,000 refugees would hold up in the city, mostly taken in by local mosques. The conditions were horrendously unhygienic. The Greek and Bulgarian forces were both desperate to reach the city first, but Prince Constantine of Greece beat them by mere hours. 
The prince strolled into Salonika, joined by the Patriarch of Athens, with the streets lined with its Greek inhabitants waving blue and white banners. The eventual plan for Salonika was for the mosques to be taken over by the Patriarch of Athens and converted it into churches. But in a gesture of good faith, the Greeks delayed this action so the mosques could be used by Muslim refugees fleeing the fighting. In the city, there was an old and famous church called the Hagia Sophia, not to be confused with another former church of the same name in Constantinople. This church had been converted into a mosque after the Ottoman conquest of Salonika in 1430. On November 13th, a platoon of Bulgarian soldiers kicked out the Muslim refugees residing in this mosque and erected a cross and a Bulgarian flag atop the church. Not to be outdone, the Greeks did the same with two other mosques in the city. The Serbians triggered a war scare in Europe when they occupied Alessio along the Adriatic coast on November 17th, which was crossing the red line set by Austria, who mobilized their armies in Bosnia along the Serbian border. In response, the Russian Minister of War wrote up orders to mobilize their armies along the Austrian borders, but the foreign minister warned that this would probably cause the Germans to mobilize as well, and they both believed aiding Serbia in its goal of regional hegemony was not in Russia's best interest. On the Thracian front, the Bulgarians attacked the Ottoman forces of Lozengrad, which fell after three days of siege. This triggered a shambling retreat for the Ottomans, who suffered serious casualties at the battles Luela Burgas and Babeski, which left Adirne as the last fortress city standing between the Balkan League and Constantinople. The Bulgarians would go on to besiege Adirne for five months, but it would not fall. During their retreats, the Ottomans committed more atrocities against the local Christians. One incident, confirmed by the Carnegie Commission, described how a Christian child was tossed into the air by a Turkish soldier and was then skewered on his bayonet. The Bulgarians also committed atrocities against the Turks and Muslims who were unable to escape before their arrival, destroying mosques with fire and dynamite. The Turkish forces retreating from Lozengrad made their way to a fortress to the west of Constantinople, Katalka and formed a defensive line against the oncoming Bulgarians, who were beginning to exhaust their soldiers and supply lines. On November 17th, the Bulgarians began their assault on the Katalka line, and although it wasn't the biggest battle in terms of the number of soldiers, it's considered the most violent of the Balkan Wars. The artillery barrages of the Bulgarians created a thick covering of smoke over the battlefield, prophesying the coming war in Europe. The clouds could be seen from Constantinople, which spread fear amongst both the Christians and Muslims of the city. Both feared impending massacres, the Muslims feared it coming from the incoming Bulgarians, and the Christians feared it coming from the retreating Turks. And both had reasons for believing it. The embassies and consulates of the great powers were swarmed with Christians seeking asylum. The fears were so high that the Sultan fled the city, the first and last time an Ottoman ruler would do so under duress. Despite these fears, both Adirne and the Katalka line held out. The Turks learned from their mistakes earlier in the campaign and chose to fight on preferable conditions, including luring the Bulgarians into marshes south of the Turkos forest. The sea defenses of the Ottomans were also powerful enough to rebuff the Greek navy, who tried to land an invasion along the Sea of Marmara. This last instance in particular was an extremely useful lesson for the Ottomans later when repelling the landings at Gallipoli in the Great War. These successes along the Katalka line boosted the confidence of the CUP, who called for do-or-die resistance against the Bulgarians. But Kamil Pasha and the Liberal Unionists saw the moment differently. Rather than continuing the fight, they wanted to use this position of strength to get a better deal in the negotiated peace, which in their mind simply meant losing less territory than they initially feared. Since the CUP were still calling for resistance, Kamil Pasha had their newspapers shut down and hundreds of them arrested or exiled to isolated parts of the empire. With them out of the way, they could push forward to peace. The Bulgarians and Serbs had continued to pour more men into the battles along the Katalka line, but before a final battle could commence, an armistice was signed on December 3rd, 1912. By the time of the armistice, all that remained of Ottoman Europe was the land behind the Katalka line, Gallipoli, and a few patches in mountainous Albania. Despite the fighting around Adirne having also stopped, the Bulgarians began receiving reinforcements from the Serbs, and they denied the Turks the ability to resupply the city with food. The only country that didn't sign the armistice was Greece, who continued to besiege the Ottoman-held city of Ionia, which would surrender months later. <laughs> 
Serbia and Montenegro were also still active in Albania. Scutari had still not fallen to Montenegrin forces, which put King Nicholas in a tight spot, not being very popular within his own kingdom and having put all of his eggs into the Scutari basket. In December of 1912, the great powers met in London to try and resolve the crisis in the Balkans. They had agreed to create an autonomous Albania, with a prince selected by the great powers to rule over them, while also granting Serbia access to the sea. They also tried to resolve the fighting between the Balkan League and the Ottomans, but the Turks were reluctant to give up more territory in Thrace, especially Adirna, which they had managed to hold on to despite the Bulgarian onslaught. Kamil Pasha's government laid out their terms to the conference in London, which included them ceding all territory west of the province of Adirna, but Adirna itself remaining under Ottoman control, refusal to cede any islands in the Aegean, and a final resolution over the sovereignty of Crete as dictated by the great powers. This proposal was rejected by the Balkan League. On January 13th, a counterproposal was made to the Ottomans. The city of Adirna would be ceded to the Bulgarians in addition to all the territory they had agreed to cede to the Balkan League, and the fate of the Aegean Islands would be determined by the great powers. This counterproposal also came with a warning that the war would resume were they not accepted. The Ottomans didn't want to give up Adirna. Not only had the city not yet fallen, but numerous Ottoman sultans were buried in the city and its mosques, and to give them up would be a national disgrace. But it looked as though Kamil's government was going to give in to the demands. So the members of the CUP within the government and the army orchestrated a coup. Since the start of the war in the Balkans, the CUP had tried to come to an understanding with the liberal unionists. They wanted a united front against the foreign invaders. But when the liberals appointed Kamil Pasha as the Grand Vizier, their relationship became more strained. Kamil Pasha refused to cooperate with the CUP members who had experience in military matters. It became worse after the Grand Vizier had large numbers of CUP members arrested for publicly supporting the war while the government was trying to end it. The former war minister, Sevket Pasha, a CUP ally, had made war plans for a potential conflict in the Balkans during his term, but the liberal unionist government refused to call him back to service. At some point between November and December, the military officers of the CUP had met and discussed the possibility of a coup. They initially shelved the idea, believing it would demoralize the public during a time of war, but they did set up a trigger system for such a coup. If Kamil Pasha tried to pass the blame for surrendering onto the CUP, they would go into action. Well, on January 22nd, the Grand Vizier called for a Grand Council, which would include not only the cabinet, but a bunch of members from the opposition. The purpose of this Grand Council, it was believed, was to accept the terms given at the London Conference. This was the last straw for the CUP. On January 23rd, religious students gathered outside the Sublime Port. Scenes like this had brought down numerous sultans and governments before. The Grand Vizier and the Cabinet had met at the Sublime Port to draft a formal reply to the ultimatum, accepting their terms. But before that could happen, Enver Bey and a small group of men burst through the chamber doors and held the government at gunpoint. The Minister of War, Nazim Pasha, confronted them but was shot and killed. With blood having already been spilled, they forced Kamil Pasha to resign as Grand Vizier. After the coup, Enver Bey said this to a French newspaper. I sincerely regret having been forced to intervene again to overthrow a government, but it was impossible to wait. A delay of a few hours, and the country would have been shamefully delivered to the enemy. Our army has never been stronger, and I really see no reason that compels us to capitulate to such monstrous demands. The CUP were in a precarious situation. They could and did argue that in the six months they had been out of power, everything had gotten worse. The Ottomans had lost Libya to the Italians, and most of the Balkans and Aegean had been lost to the Balkan League. On the other hand, the entire public justification for the coup was holding on to the city of Adirna. If it fell or was surrendered, the liberal unionists were in an even better position to orchestrate their own counter-coup. The internal politics of the capital were inextricably tied to the fate of a city under siege. Despite all of these tensions, the CUP were surprisingly gracious once they came into power. They didn't engage in mass arrests or repression like the liberals had. 
Their strategy was to try and gain the support of the whole country behind the war effort. They released a few opposition members that had been arrested during the coup and sent others into political exile by appointing them as diplomats to foreign countries. Mahmoud Sefket Pasha was reappointed as Minister of War, but on top of that he was also made the Grand Vizier. And the new cabinet only had three actual CUP members, Saeed Hilm Pasha, Haki Adil, and Hari Bey, all of whom were seen as moderates. Despite these changes calming political tensions in the capital, abroad this resulted in confusion. The delegates at the London Conference suspended all actions until they could receive new instructions from their governments. They drafted a note for the Turkish delegation and delivered it on January 29th, declaring that peace negotiations had ended and they would let the armistice expire on February 3rd. The Turkish delegation responded on January 30th, emphasizing that they could not surrender the city of Adirna wholesale, but they could give up the part of the city on the right bank of the Maritza River, while retaining the left bank which contained the mosques and tombs of past sultans. They also agreed to allow the great powers to determine the sovereignty of the islands and the Aegean. Their final point was asking the great powers to give up their capitulations from the Ottoman Empire, and allow the Turkish government to tax European merchants the same as Ottoman ones. But the great powers refused. The fighting resumed, and although the Turks held out along most of the Katalkan line, a few cities did fall, and with that, this brief moment of renewed confidence was dashed. Even military hardliners like Sevket Pasha grew concerned that the Bulgarians, Serbs, and Greeks wouldn't just capture Constantinople, but also cross the Bosphorus into Anatolia, at which point the Turks would have nothing but the geography to hold them back. The commanders on the ground were telling the government that their lines were on the brink of collapsing. Numerous officers in the military were arrested based upon rumors that they were plotting a coup, and the government sent a secret letter to the media that if they reported on any division within the cabinet, they would be shut down, and that foreign journalists would be deported. The Ottomans and the CUP were running out of time. Adirna would finally fall to the Balkan League on March 26, 1913. This was the bloodiest battle of the war, with casualties anywhere between 40 and 60,000. The Turkish commander ordered all stocks of bread in the city destroyed during their retreat. As the Bulgarians entered the city, they had to step over countless dead bodies, which littered the streets, victims of artillery shells, cholera, and hunger. The Turks managed to hold out along the Katalka line and in Gallipoli, but everywhere else they continued to retreat or surrender. The Turkish commander holding the city of Scutari surrendered it to King Nicholas on April 23, 1913. It's widely believed that this surrender to Montenegro was due to a bribe from the king to the Ottoman commander, though this has never been conclusively proven. When the Montenegrins finally entered Scutari, it was in bad shape. Civilians were starving and the artillery bombardment made much of the city uninhabitable. But this did not stop the Montenegrin soldiers from pillaging what was left. Austria-Hungary demanded that Montenegro withdraw, but Russia was never going to allow that to happen by force. This Scutari crisis was eventually resolved when King Nicholas was paid off with a loan of 6 million francs, after which his army withdrew from the city. On May 30th, 1913, the Treaty of London was signed, which ejected the Ottomans from Europe, save for Constantinople and a strip of land drawn from the east coast of the Black Sea to the Aegean. As far as the Ottomans were concerned, they had nothing left to fight over. But the Balkan states had their most desired prize, Macedonia which was now up for grabs. Serbia occupied the most Macedonian territory. The Bulgarians, in contrast, had very little because they had dedicated their forces to fighting the Ottomans in Thrace, where the bloodiest combat had occurred. And without the victory and sacrifices of Bulgaria at Adirna, the war would not have succeeded. They received the least amount of territory from the Treaty of London, but felt as though they had deserved more. The original plan of the Balkan League was to place the fate of Macedonia in the hands of Tsar Nicholas II of Russia to arbitrate. The Serbian plan was to argue that since they physically occupied the most territory, they should receive the most. On top of this, Serbia wanted more territory in Macedonia to make up for not getting what they wanted in Albania because of the Austrians. The Romanian government, who had sat out the war, demanded that the northeastern corner of Bulgaria be given to Romania in order to retain a balance of power in the region. The Greeks wanted to expel ethnic Bulgarians from the region around Salonika, 
as well as lay claim to more territory in Thrace. The Turks saw these dividing lines emerging, and fostered hostilities between the Balkan states as much as they could, all the while reinforcing the Katalka line in anticipation of war breaking out again. In late spring and early summer of 1913, the Serbs and Greeks began their process of Serbianization and Hellenization of their respective portions of Macedonia. In the Bulgarian-occupied area, they began to victimize Jews and Turks living in the region. Those who did not accept a new nationality being placed on them were driven out of their homes, harassed, or murdered. On June 1st, Greece and Serbia made an alliance with the explicit purpose of keeping Bulgaria out of the recently won Macedonia. The Bulgarians were feeling abused by everyone, especially Russia, who had pressured them to hand over territory demanded by the Romanians. On June 13th, 1913, Greek and Serbian forces began attacking Bulgarian soldiers. On June 28th, Bulgarian general Savov, during negotiations chaired by Tsar Nicholas II, gave secret orders to his troops in Macedonia and Serbia to launch attacks on the Serbs. The Bulgarian army had been under tremendous strain, not only had they taken heavy casualties during the war, but the soldiers that remained were exhausted and were demanding that they be demobilized so they could return home. In order to maintain order, the Bulgarians needed an enemy. On the night of June 29th, the Bulgarian army attacked the Serbs in Macedonia along the Vardar River. The attack had been ordered against the wishes of Bulgaria's liberal prime minister, Stoyan Denev, but Tsar Ferdinand overruled his opposition. This confusion gave time to the other Balkan states who orchestrated their own attacks. The Greek army began attacking Bulgarian forces in Salonika, which were quickly wiped out. Montenegro also declared war, but was quickly overshadowed by Romania, who declared war on July 10th. Meanwhile, the Ottomans were still licking their wounds when on the way to the Sublime Port, Grand Vizier Sevket Pasha was assassinated. With the government in chaos, command of the situation went to Ahmed Semel Pasha, the military commander of the capital. He ordered the roundup and exile of opposition members and placed the city under a 10 p.m. curfew. Twelve men were implicated in the plot, sentenced to death, and then executed on June 24th. Members of the Sultan's family were also sentenced to death, including our old friend, Prince Sabahaddin, who was sentenced in absentia. Succeeding Sevket Pasha was Mehmed Said Halim a grandson of King Muhammad Ali of Egypt. This time, the CUP was done playing the unity game, filling the cabinet with nothing but their own members. While all of the internal issues were going on, the Ottomans never lost sight of the situation in the Balkans. They knew the Balkan League was falling apart and had too many unresolved overlapping claims for peace to be maintained, and so the CUP made sure to keep the army on a war footing in order to take advantage of any chance to reclaim territory especially Adirna. Fighting had broken out among the former Balkan League members on June 30th, at which point the Ottomans put their preparations into double time. However, they had to reassure the great powers that they were not planning on declaring war against Bulgaria like all the other Balkan states did, but rather were simply going to enforce the treaty provisions calling for Bulgaria to vacate Turkish territory. The CUP supported renewed war with Bulgaria, but the cabinet was divided because they weren't certain of the outcome. They were particularly concerned about the reactions from the great powers, as well as about their finances. Since the cabinet was divided, the interior minister, Talat Pasha, and the grand vizier, Said Halim Pasha, took matters into their own hands. On July 10th, diplomats from Bulgaria arrived in Constantinople to open up negotiations, but they were rejected on a bogus claim that there had been a change in government in Bulgaria. This was followed on July 13th by the commander-in-chief of the Turkish military being ordered to, and I quote, reoccupy Turkish territory. When the foreign press asked if this meant that the Ottomans were going to recapture Adirna, the Grand Vizier insisted that they were only occupying territory given to them in the Treaty of London. But he would order them to reoccupy Adirna if it looked like it was going to be recaptured by the Greeks or some other Balkan power. Well, it just so happened that on July 24th, the need to retake Adirna arrived, and so they reoccupied the city on the fifth anniversary of the Young Turks' revolution. On August 7th, the Great Powers sent a note to the Ottoman government telling them to respect the Treaty of London and withdraw from Adirna. The cabinet responded to their note on August 11th, politely telling them to shove it. Luckily for the Ottomans, the Great Powers were divided over how to move forward, 
and so the Turks were allowed to retain Adirna. They began negotiations with the Bulgarians on September 3rd, and on September 30th they signed the Treaty of Constantinople with Bulgaria. The treaty forced Bulgaria to acknowledge Ottoman control of Adirna, Kirkarli, and Didimotaiko, and the surrounding territory. The Ottomans ceded the port of Dagagash, which is modern-day Alexandropolis, to Bulgaria. The Ottomans are not quite finished in Europe, but most of their future attentions would be directed toward the Middle East, the last remnants of their empire, and their most vulnerable weak spot. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you can reach me by email. History of the Modern Middle East at gmail.com or via Twitter at HMME Podcast. You can check the website history of the modern Middle East.com or the show notes to see the sources used for this episode. Thanks for listening. <laughs>